Welcome back to Switch to Linux. Well, today we're going to continue looking at our desktop environments and we're going to look at KDE. Now, before we get in here, I want to clarify something. This was a very valid criticism on the GNOME video. I'd like to clarify it. When I'm going into the history here, it's not meant to be an all-inclusive historical overview from the beginning all the way to now. There are excellent channels out there that will cover those types of things. All I'm trying to do here is give a little bit of background where it came from, and then we're gonna skip a lot of stuff in the middle and tell us where we are right now as of 2019. So with that, KDE was one of the first, in fact, I believe it was the first desktop environment to come out to be integrated with the, the GNU Linux experience. And so its name is actually an acronym, just like GNOME, and it stands for Cool Desktop Environment. It has cool with a K, so you know it's cool. And uh, the reason why it was K and not C is because this was actually the naming spoof off of the Common Desktop Environment, which was another popular one out there, although I'm not sure if it was ever in, uh, on GNU Linux or not. I, I didn't actually do that research. But KDE is actually based on the Qt framework or Qt framework. Now, the Qt framework is what we mentioned last time when we looked at GNOME, where the reason GNOME came about is because when the Qt framework first came about, it was actually not a free software as in you had to go and buy it. It was an open source software, so once you did buy it, you could open it up and do other things with it, but it was originally released under a commercial open source license, and that is why GNOME created their GTK framework and created the GNOME desktop environment. So at this point, we had two of them. So it was only about a year or so later that when KDE really became this major success that QT got wrapped up with inside of that and they agreed to make it free for life. So they, it was both financially free and so open source software free at the same time. So the first beta release of KDE came out in 1997 and after about a year or so of comments, bug fixes, repairs, in 1998, they released the first stable version of KDE-1. And yeah, it looked like an operating system from 1998. But hey, it was in 1998, so it looked great. It was awesome. So skip forward, they had several other versions of there. And in 2014, they released KDE-5, which is the Plasma desktop that we know now. I think we're on 512 or 514, somewhere around there at the time of this recording. I don't remember exactly. But uh, after 2014, the release of KDE5 Plasma, then about 18 months later in 2016, they released KDE Neon. So I have some videos about KDE Neon on this channel. So Neon itself, according to them, is not even a technically a distro. However, you can run it like a distribution. What KDE Neon is, is a testing ground. So you have a core which is based on Ubuntu. But in place of any desktop in Ubuntu, they've replaced all that with a constantly rolling KDE framework. So Neon is always your best choice when you're talking about going in and having a absolute latest rolling version of Plasma on your system. So that's why it can be used as a distro. I always just like to point out that little difference, that according to them, it's not a distro. However, it can be used as one. The purpose of it is to test all of the different KDE applications in a rolling manner. Where else can you get the rolling versions? Well, Arch always rolls, of course. You also have OpenSUSE, which is another distribution which uses KDE as one of its chief uh, chief releases. And that one has the Tumbleweed version, which also rolls as well. Neon's probably going to roll slightly faster, but nothing too significant. Now, as far as modern Plasma is concerned, it is, like GNOME, one of the most modern desktops in that it will have your touchscreen support. It will have your online account support. However, most KDE versions that I've seen don't actually include the online accounts out of the box. Hopefully we start seeing a little bit more of that for those that want those features, but you can install them very easily. So with GNOME, all of that is integrated directly in. With KDE, usually add a, add a few other packages and it will appear inside of your settings menu. So anything you can do with GNOME regarding 
running your online accounts or integration, things like that. You're also going to be able to do it on KDE, which is why it's so good because it is, like GNOME, a very, very modern operating system. So it's not like Mate, which is still a little bit old, or XFCE, which isn't quite as up to date with the modern functions and features. Not that those are bad, it's just for a different demographic. But if you want to use those features, you do have two major ones. KDE is available for most distributions, and whether or not you are installing it directly on install or if you're adding it from the repos later, you can usually find the instructions for how to do that. It is highly flexible and highly customizable. It absolutely, you can do anything with it. Now the reason it was less controversial from GNOME at the first beginning is because it maintained a traditional desktop feel like the Windows environment. However, some distributions do tweak it a little bit. You know, Kubuntu, I believe they'll put the panel at the top and things like Ubuntu usually does. A few other versions do some different things, but most of the vanilla KDE it is set up very much like a Windows system. But because it's so highly flexible, you can adjust the menus between multiple different types of menus. You can do widgets, widgetized items, all sorts of other features which are very good for just setting up your computer exactly the way you want. And they do this by being a highly widgetized system. Out of the box, there's a good several dozen widgets built into the system. Every type of clock, from a digital clock to an analog clock to a binary and a fuzzy clock, is all embedded in the system and you can swap between them very easily. Multiple types of menu systems and the ability to add other menus as people develop them. So it does have a lot of the you know, we might call them the widgets or in the GNOME world, you might say the extensions, but those are directly built from the KDE team, which is distinct and why I like that better than the GNOME where all of the extensions have to be installed from third party sources instead. You can still add some third parties, which does mean that that same thing that gave us the evil GNOME could potentially happen in KDE as well. So always make sure you're installing any widgets from very trusted sources anytime you're going to do that. Um, KDE also, it is much lighter on system resources than GNOME is right now. So there was a time when it was far more bloated. So if you see people talk about KDE is just a giant bloated mess, that was a real thing way back a long time ago, especially when Plasma first came out. It just had so many things going on. It didn't have the, the streamlining done right. And so frankly, it was a bloated mess for a period of time. As of right now, when I'm recording this, the basic KDE system only runs in about 500 megabytes, which is quite a bit less than GNOME directly out of the box. And so it is going to be appropriate if you do have a lower spec machine, you can use KDE. So a lower spec modern system, definitely check out KDE for that. As far as your basic pros, we already said this, highly flexible, highly widgetized, very good for the flexibility to set it up though any way that you want. It's also very light on resources, as we already said. So if you are looking for that lower end machine, KDE is an option. And then the next pro is options, 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 options. You can go into that settings panel and get lost. Fortunately, the more recent versions, they've organized it a little bit better. It's not as hard to get lost in the thing, but there are so many options for anything and everything you possibly want to do. Single click icons, double click icons, transparency, no transparency, wobbly windows, no wobbly windows, whatever you want to do. So if you like customizing your desktop, KDE is absolutely unequivocally the most flexible and customizable desktop we have. Now onto the cons. Again, options. There are so many options, it is options to a fault. So a person that does not necessarily want to customize your desktop, unless you like the way it looks right out of the box, you're probably not gonna like KDE because you're gonna get lost in all of the options. So that is certainly a downside. I per personally prefer the options to be there, but that's me and not you. The next major con is the QT framework is not nearly as modern looking and well integrated as the GTK framework. So a lot of people choose to go with GNOME or Cinnamon or Budgie, something based on the GNOME 3 environment because GTK does integrate better with systems a little bit more than QT does. Now, can you cross them together? Absolutely. KDE does have some fixes for this. 
having GTK based applications, does have a GTK settings options, but nevertheless, GTK as a generality does seem to be integrated a little bit better than Qt does, but that's I think in a way a very subjective thing. So there is a brief walkthrough through the KDE or the cool desktop environment starting from the very beginning on up to the modern views. You can check this out on any distribution that might be out there. Just have a look around for an internet search uh, how to put KDE onto your desktop. And of course, make sure that you're backing up any data if you're doing something to a production machine in case there's any goof ups. So that, thanks for watching. Let me know your thoughts and comments down below.